Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. We finally have a name, it's Psychiatry Unboxed. I have a great guest on cue for the show today. This is Dr. Jonathan Stay. Dr. Jonathan Stay, PhD, R. psych, is a practicing clinical psychologist and adjunct assistant professor at the University of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. In Canada, clinically, he specializes in the assessment and treatment of concurrent addictive and psychiatric disorders. He's a two-time winner of the U of University of Calgary's Award for Excellence in Clinical Supervision and the 2022 recipient of the Psychologist Association of Alberta's Media and Science Communication Award. He's the primary co-editor of Investigating Clinical Psychology, Pseudoscience, Fringe Science, and Controversies. His forthcoming book about mental health misinformation and pseudoscience will be published in 2025 by Penguin Random House Canada and Oxford University Press. Enjoy this episode. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. We have a great guest. Um, they're always great guests. I'm waiting to still one day we'll have a terrible guest that we'll talk shit about them later. But for right now, we have a great guest. We have Dr. Jonathan Stay. I will let him introduce himself and then we'll kind of jump on in. I could be that terrible guest. I hope I could won't be. Uh, could live be. up to that. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. I'm really excited to be here and excited to chat with you. I've been waiting for this a long time. We've been, yeah. we've been friends for a while, but haven't got on your podcast. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I work in a tertiary care uh, concurrent disorders clinic. So what that means is that we um, treat people with concurrent addiction and psychiatric concerns in a hospital setting. And I've been doing that for about a decade on a, a really wonderful interdisciplinary team with other psychologists and psychiatrists and addiction medicine physicians and yeah. nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, etc. So I've been doing that for kind of full time. Um, and it's really awesome because I get to do individual psychotherapy, um, group therapy, case management, uh, consultation, etc. And then um, that's my clinical role. Academically, I'm an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Calgary. Um, so I get my hands in some research endeavors. Mostly I'm just sitting on uh, dissertation committees and making students really nervous about trying to <laughs> have them pass their candidacy exams. But it's really great because they're at the you know forefront and cutting edge of the field. So yeah. that's a really great opportunity. And then at the side of my desk, I've been, like you, kind of engaging in this uh, science advocacy, science communication work, and I've been doing that in a variety of uh, ways on social media, and then um, I'm currently writing a book on the topic, so yeah. I'm excited about that. We'll jump into the book a little bit later. We'll get there in a bit, but I, I, I really appreciate what you're doing in regards to like the your your clinical work, because that's like the real work, right? Like the real work that like way that mental health is supposed to be practiced right the whole interdisciplinary team and providing you know not just a psychiatrist here not just a psychologist there not just x y and z over there it's the whole wide spectrum totally and i'm pretty i like to say too like i'm really proud of our clinic because traditionally and historically um the addiction and mental health streams have been very separate so like yeah. the addiction world and, the, and the, the clinical addiction world has been separate and then you had the mental health world and then uh decades ago you know our uh, the founder of our clinic his name is dr nadi al gabali he actually won the order of canada but he nice. was really a pioneer of concurrent disorders and kind of that integrated model and yeah. so that's what we're doing that's why i work more of a specialized care so the patients that come to us haven't um they're not they've been to treatment before and it's it's they're still struggling and so they need kind of a step up in the intensity and kind of the um I guess the expertise and just that, like you said, that multidisciplinary approach where we're getting uh, a whole bunch of different uh, evidence-based health disciplines uh, yeah. helping. Yeah, it's been one of like my, my critiques of the field, right? Is like, so that's, you know, the main reason I went and got my like my addiction medicine training as well, because I was like, these things are so intertwined. You can't just silo them off and pretend like, oh, mental health is one thing and addiction is one thing and they're totally unrelated. And anytime I come across like my colleagues who are like, oh, I don't, I don't deal with drugs or I don't deal with people who are using stuff. I'm just like, well, what are you really doing here then? <laughs> totally. Yeah. All right. Right. And the so, the, the right. concurrent the comorbid rates bear that out too. So oh yeah, I mean it's it's I mean it's almost necessary. I feel like they have to be 
together or else you're again, doing half the job in general. So anyway, so that's one thing. So we're going to talk about misinformation, right? And health misinformation and health advocacy and all the fun stuff that's out there in the world. But I always start off with a, f- with a fun surprise question. And I, I think I spoiled it a little bit. <laughs> um, one of the things that like, I guess drew us together too is like we're both wrestling, wrestling fans, prof- professional wrestling fans. And you're from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, home mm-hmm. of the great Bret Hart. So I threw it on the Twitter. I was like, aside from Bret Hart, the greatest Canadian wrestler, perhaps the greatest wrestler of all time, who's the second greatest Canadian wrestler of all time? Canadian wrestler. Canadian oh, that's wrestler. A good one. There's, a, there's a lot of them. There is. I'm going to, it's sort of a cop out because it's the same family, but I loved <laughs> Owen Hart. Yeah. I did. I loved Owen Hart. He was he was a fantastic wrestler. I, you know, I've watched a lot of documentaries around him. They said that everyone kind of loved him just as a guy. Like he was, yeah. I think he was the the youngest in the family, and he was playing a lot of pranks in the locker room. Um, but at the end of the day, like everyone just said, he had such a warm uh, heart, and he was so kind of a person. And then, of course, there was that awful tragedy, which as a kid I, I watched live when he oh, wow. he fell he fell from the rafters and, and died. It was one of the biggest tragedies and. In wrestling, so yeah, I gotta say Owen. Yeah, I, I I don't think you can go really go wrong with that. I think he's you know if you're a technical wrestling fan, he's a he's a mat wizard, right? Um, his match with Brett, like that was a WrestleMania ten, perhaps the greatest opening WrestleMania match of all time, um, and so many so many memories. And I think, yeah, I think for I think I was in high school, a junior, I think when he when he died. Um, when mm-hmm. he had the accident, when he was killed over there. And for a lot of people, like I think, especially growing up in wrestling, that was like the first kind of exposure to this traumatic public event. So, I mean, for those who are not familiar, we're going to dive into it a little bit, but he, you know, he had this entrance where he would come on down from the rafters um, on a rope or something, a cord, right? He would kind of swing on mm-hmm. down, come to the ring. And, you know, unfortunately there was an accident where the, it wasn't attached and he plummeted from the rafters into the ring and, and, and died. And the show went on, you know, it was this kind of great controversy of like, how do we deal with this? Then the show went on and I think it was like the middle of the show or something like that. So they still had an yeah. hour, hour and a half or something to kind of go. So terrible, terrible tragedy. And the wrestlers themselves are obviously devastated. Like it was hard for yeah. them to, to move on. Yeah, and you think about it, there's like, what, 10, 15,000 people in the audience who are just kind of like having to <laughs> witness this, see this, and then keep going with the show, and then people watching at home too, so. Yeah. One of the darkest spots in wrestling, but. Who is your reason. favorite uh, Canadian, number two? I, you know, I, I, I'm a, I was a big fan of Jericho. I think oh, Jericho's yeah. had a huge kind of, uh, this massive just career, Chris Jericho. I met him, God, I think also when I was in high school, he was at a signing, so he was that was kind of good. I've I've started to appreciate Kenny Omega a lot, um, so I think there's been, I would say probably Chris Jericho though, over time. I can't go wrong. I with endorse that. that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm more of a, an old school yeah. fan. Like I don't know what kind of the yeah. new guys, but I, I remember Jericho, and I remember when he broke out in the WWE. So yeah, that was yeah. I think the year 2000. It was around, around yeah, because yeah, it was he Y2J. Was, yeah. Y2J. The he was a yeah. Y2J problem. So yeah, yeah, and then he's he's still going 20, 30 years later. So <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into some stuff. So health misinformation. What? What is that term? There's a lot of people who throw the term around and then without really knowing what it says, but what what does that mean and how does that have an impact on people's health, mental health as a whole? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think the scientific literature defines misinformation in a number of different ways. The easiest way in which I've been using it, and I think... Um, Timothy Caulfield, he's another science communicator, and he's been researching this stuff for decades, and I think he uses it in a similar manner as me, as just sort of this umbrella term kind of garbage category just to represent kind of fake news with respect to uh, science and health. Um, If we want to get a bit more technical, I think it's um, it's more about um, kind of false news that's not deliberate versus disinformation 
or propaganda, which is essentially lies, so the kind of deliberate um, purveying of, of false information with regards to health and science. Yeah, and I think there's that's important to kind of make that distinction. There's misinformation, which is which is unintentional, and then disinformation, which is more intentional, spreading the propaganda that's there. And we see this like with social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Is like it's really hard to separate the two, right? And then and then actually separate between what is misinformation, disinformation, and then what is information, right? Totally. It's hard. And some people might not even know that they're like, it's not always intentional. And um, yeah, it can be really hard. And I think either way, like you, you asked about whether it impacts people. And I think regardless of sort of the intent, it really does, right? Because it can, it can really, um, well, affect the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see our health. Um, and importantly, it can affect our health decisions. And so there hasn't been, to my knowledge, so much research with respect to how mental health misinformation affects uh, our behaviors. But in the area of health literacy and kind of health misinformation more generally, there is. And so we know, for example, that um, that health misinformation does negatively impact um, behaviors like um, like masking and, and refusing vaccination and, and um, that sort of stuff. Less so in the mental health field, but it, there's reason it's a reasonable hypothesis to assume that um, that's an extension. Yeah. And I think, well, what are some ways that it does show up specifically like in the mental health world? I know that we kind of come across it and we kind of combat it a lot of times um, in our own like Twitter world. Um, but what are some examples of, of what we see and come across often? Yeah. I mean, it's it's really everywhere in, in just sort of different <laughs> domains. So, you know, we see it in our healthcare systems and, and healthcare. So, um we could see it whether it's a regulated health professional um, trying to provide a pseudoscientific treatment, for example, like energy healing or um, homeopathy, and that could be done by regulated professionals. And and then in the alternative medicine industry, it could be done by unregulated health professionals. So there's that kind of stuff. And then, like you said, there's more of the the social media popular culture stuff so you know Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop is you know that's her that's her multi-million dollar company that's platforming yeah. people like Kelly Brogan who's a psychiatrist who's advertising coffee enemas as a treatment for depression which has zero evidence behind that right. um, similarly there's uh, you know the the Kardashians platforming uh, Dr. Ammon which you've been pretty vocal about because he's using <laughs> Uh, what was it, SPECT brain in imaging to diagnose mental health disorders and then and then sell unsupported supplements. And you can't diagnose mental disorders based on brain imaging. So um, th that's the kind of insidious mis misinformation that's there because it's, it's, you know, it's on these giant platforms and people are going to watch the Kardashians and, and take it at face value because, you know, not many people are aware of how to diagnose mental disorders and what supplements can do. So, yeah, we certainly see it uh, in that area. And then, of course, there's the whole just kind of social media um, examples of misinformation on social media more broadly. So there is um, there was a study, for example, that looked at TikTok um, ADHD videos and they found that they analyzed the most popular ADHD videos on TikTok and about 50% were classified as misleading, um, which is alarming because these aren't trivial numbers. I mean, th these they're, the videos are viewed billions of times, which is just a, in, you yeah. know, a really large number. I, I'm fortunate to have joined a research team by a a guy named Marco Zenon, who's a postdoc, and he's he's really uh, he's a policy public policy expert, and he does this kind of research too. And he asked me to come on board, looking at TikTok videos with the hashtag mental health. So just kind of a bit broader than uh, ADHD. And I think we found similar findings. It was about one third uh, we were able to classify it as one third of videos that were offering mental health advice were misleading. And again, those videos were viewed billions of times. So you know, it's one third, but it's billions of views that's a lot yeah and I, th I think people don't realize like you know part of my kind of rise per se was like through tiktok and i have like a decent size following right i have 76 75 thousand mm -hmm. people following me on there and like you have your few videos that hit your million but like again those the bigger accounts that i see like they have like 
millions of followers, right? And they routinely will put out like million view videos per every week, right? Every day, they're just putting it out there. And they're saying whatever it is that they want. And like, I, you know, I get tagged in these videos and the people who are telling you like, Adderall is meth, right? I, I just made a video put out today, like Adderall is meth and get your kids off of meth and like, you know, take them off this stuff there. Or like all, you know, the, the typical stuff that, that diminishes mental health and the severity of that stuff, right? Like, oh, just, you know, exercise and your depression will go away. And it's like, you know, there's, there's hints of reality in there, right? Like there is an aspect where like a part of a treatment plan, a comprehensive treatment plan is like exercise, mm -hmm. you know, or being physically active, but it's not the only thing, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, and of course, just, you know, riffing off that, you know, there's, people with giant platforms like Elon Musk who yeah. will also make comments about Ritalin or Wellbutrin um, that are just yeah, uh, yeah. wrong. It's misinformation. And so whether it's deliberate or not, it's being broadcasted to so many people and then they, they believe it, unfortunately. Or even if they don't, it's sort of that illusory truth effect where people start to hear it and then it sows seeds of doubt. Yeah. So. And there's that aspect too where like it's almost a double-edged sword right because i think within the mental health field there's been traditionally this kind of view of keeping things secret right keeping things as almost trade secrets right we are we're very hush hush about how we do things you know and then the doors kind of got blown open as like you know the dsm was available on amazon and everybody was able to kind of download it and pick it up and buy it and read through it but at the same time like people were able to put out whatever they wanted because there wasn't the, you know there wasn't as much kind of quote unquote scientific fact around it right totally so it's trouble it's trouble but so what can we do in a way then to kind of <laughs> combat it how how can we as a whole or people who have official licenses degrees who are trying to do things a straight and narrow what can we do things how can we make things better yeah, I, I, at least for, I haven't looked at the code of ethics for different professions, but at least for psychologists, it's promoting evidence-based patient care and practicing it is baked into our, our codes of ethics. So, for example, the for psychologists, the Canadian Code of Ethics has a fourth order principle called responsibility to society. And that means we need to be promoting and practicing evidence-based care. And the converse of that is that we need to be calling out and debunking misinformation and pseudoscience because we have to, we have that kind of responsibility to society. Now, people will do that in a variety of different ways and people have different comfort levels of doing that. So, you know, you can do that locally at your, you know, clinics and hospitals and um, kind of your regions. You can join professional associations and maybe do workshops and continuing education um, services. You know, th that th that's sort of a, an avenue for people to take. Uh, other people like you and I have sort of taken the social media. Um, again, that's you know I, i'm i'm saying this is baked into our ethics but that doesn't mean that pe everyone needs to get on the social media and do it because that has its own kind of challenges with it time um harassment <laughs> that we've all seen so um and then just um just kind of yeah comfort level with it so i think there's a variety of different avenues um yeah it's tough right because there's an aspect where we're trying to promote this truth, right? In theory, the quote unquote truth. Um, but it, it's not sexy, right? <laughs> the truth isn't always mm -hmm. sexy. And it doesn't appeal to as much, right? And we have to almost be sensationalism to get some traction, to get views, to get people to share stuff, to get people to comment this, you know, this chasing engagement in a way through social media. It's yeah. hard, but, you know, that's kind of how news information is spreading now right yes and there's different there's different approaches too like um which we enjoy like debunking we use that word and it's just i think it's more technically defined as um debunking misinformation head on so when it comes out so if you hear a false claim you actually go in and will challenge it and debunk it in a in a straightforward way there's also something called pre-bunking which is um based on inoculation theory which is really just um 
it's it's having it's teaching skills about early warning signs what misinformation looks like um, kind of teaching the science literacy skills so kind of giving a little bit of misinformation to inoculate us against the broader forms of misinformation and so um, that's for example what I'm trying to do in my book say and you know what uh you know what we do when we kind of teach about pseudoscientific warning signs and um, teaching about science literacy digital literacy um, yeah. that kind of stuff okay what and then like I mean <clears throat> of the things that you're kind of coming across and seeing what have been some of the stuff that's been the most problematic in in terms of misinformation yeah yeah I I tend to so I, I've noticed my advocacy tends to branch around three broad kind of areas so one is sort of the wellness industry alternative medicine industry there's tons of misinformation in that space yeah. um, they have their own tactics they have their own tropes that I've been trying to unmask say so things like treating the root cause when they're not treating the root cause it's just a trope that they've adopted to sow distrust in modern medicine by implying that we don't treat the root cause we only mask symptoms but they can treat it by balancing our miss our unbalanced chakras or whatever it is so it's sort of a faux yeah. root cause that's just one example but there's, so there's a lot of misinformation in that kind of space um, the other and, and it does apply to mental health because it, one of the hallmarks of pseudoscience is that these treatments will purport to treat a litany of conditions and that does include everything from mental health to glaucoma to COVID-19 to marital conflict like it says that we can just treat everything um, and right. so you do get a lot of people saying energy healing can treat depression or homeopathy can treat um, psychotic disorders even I've seen that so yeah. there's that whole kind of branch the alternative medicine um, misinformation then um, what I'm also writing about which um, you're totally aware of is sort of the the anti-psychiatry kind of movement um, which we have written about that as well where we see its own sort of tropes and tactics um, so for example we'll see false claims that really deny the existence of mental illness um, the whole scale rejection of psychiatric medications and saying that they're harmful um, they're used to control the masses etc and I think that stuff does a lot of harm um, because it, it's essentially it, well it does a number of things it, it firstly it stigmatizes patients um, and psychiatric treatments and confuses the hell out of people because they don't know what to believe um, its goal is ultimately to deter treatment seeking which is not good because the kind of treatment seeking that it's deterring is evidence-based and so ultimately that compromises patient care and so I think that's very harmful going back to like the wellness industry because I found that really interesting right because you know so much of the stuff that's out there is what it falls under the I mean in the US at least and and you can correct me for how it is in Canada it falls under under the dietary supplement um, labeling right the things that are being sold out there so which essentially is like the wild wild west right there are, there's nothing that's out there to kind of regulate it the FDA like we know is in place to keep things hopefully uniform so that like you know if you're getting for example, Adderall in New York is going to be the same thing as it is in California and Florida and Texas. And in theory, between like the, the generic manufacturers are supposed to be similar-ish enough and the, or this bioequivalent versus like if you're getting CBD, right, um, from the gas station, from one gas station to the <laughs> next gas station, they're going to be different. And then like these supplements that were kind of getting sold, right, are calm supplements, right, or goop supplements or the dr amen supplements whatever it is there's no regulation right exactly and that's dangerous and then they can be contaminated uh with adulterants people don't know what they're ingesting um then there's just the, the the hype around it so it's you know it's being sold as a treatment for mental health conditions with zero evidence behind it so you know symptoms can get worse um there's just no evidence behind it and, and that's sort of the you know with the supplement um aspect that's more of the i guess you can consider it kind of the pharma pharmacological aspect of the wellness industry there's also a whole branch of 
psychotherapy kind of um, wellness products. I don't know how, how I would phrase that, but essentially um, Scott Lillianfield really pioneered a lot of the work in looking into pseudoscientific treatments. And there was an estimate from a paper that um, they were estimating, this was years ago, they thought, they, they said that there were 600 brands of psychotherapy out there in the mental health world that were growing on a monthly basis. Oh, and so goodness. these 600 brands of psychotherapy could the vast majority are untested so we don't know if they work they're probably many of them are probably harmful Man many of them could be helpful but we just don't know and that's precisely the problem and a lot of them are being um they're being provided by unregulated professionals and so sometimes what the general public is unfamiliar with is that anyone can hang a shingle and call themselves a therapist or a counselor or a wellness coach because those are legally unprotected titles you don't need there's no regulatory body like a college that gives you a license to practice with those titles and so anyone can do it and without any training without any qualifications and without any expertise and it obviates codes of ethics and right. it obviates legal standards of practice which means you know we're we're ethically and legally obligated to practice a certain way um, people that in the wellness industry that call themselves wellness coaches they don't have any of those legal standards and so it's a very uh, it's a caveat emptor which means mm -hmm. buyer beware yeah. and so when a patient is being sold past life regression therapy or energy healing or any one of those 600 brands of psychotherapy that we don't know about by a wellness coach um, if when shit hits the fan so to speak yep. that patient doesn't have much recourse because there's no governing body for that provider and so their only recourse really if, if something goes awry is to file a civil lawsuit and that's not easy and that's stressful and that's you know who's going to do that so it's that that's one of the major problems and which can't really address harm yeah and that's that's the issue right is like so that's why you know i have we have malpractice insurance so that when i get sued i have some protection and we know that if something goes wrong like again we're kind of protected by a code of ethics and standards and as long as what we were doing was reasonably correct like we're protected um unless we're doing it damages like explicit damages but again with these people again those standards aren't there and that's where the problem ultimately lies right so exactly and then and and, with, and just oh, the oh, lack oh. of expertise just the lack yeah. of expertise and qualification like they don't know what they're doing so <laughs> if you're if we're sitting with a patient who's experiencing acute distress acute mental distress their su suicidal thoughts um, they're experiencing a major depressive episode or an anxiety disorder, someone that's untrained to manage those difficulties and kind of sit with the patient and help them explore it and help them to, to experience relief, um, people just aren't trained to do that. And so that's that's not good, <laughs> just yeah. to put it mildly. Yeah. And the other thing too is that like some of these therapies are not just they're not just that they're not helpful or they're or that they're benign they are they're potentially harmful as well correct absolutely yeah and i think that's an area that's received a a paucity of attention so there's not you know people often talk about the harms of medications but not so much the harms of psychotherapies and there is some research on that uh, again scott lillianfeld started with that uh, alex williams is another psychologist who um I co-edited a, a book on investigating clinical psychology and pseudoscience. It's not out yet, but Alex Williams and his co-authors wrote a chapter on harmful psychotherapies. And so it was really well done. And yeah, th they exist and, and we need to be investigating them. So some examples are uh, critical incident stress debriefing, which happens right after a, a trauma. And um, it's just, it's found not to be helpful. There's DARE programs for adolescents kind of going into jails. Um, Notoriously, yeah. there's conversion therapy, which tries to change a person's sexual orientation, which is banned in many places, rightfully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so th there's there's harm, and there can even be harms by not doing um, evidence-based treatments correctly, right? So not providing the right kind of uh, CBT for um, obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, could be uh, harmful. So. Yeah. We need, that's something that deserves more attention. 
Yeah, and I think like I've had patients who have been like, oh, I'm going to go check out this person. Again, like Reiki healers or energy healers. And I'm just like, yeah. I was like, what? don't, please don't. And then they'll come back to me and they'd be like, well, you know, they did the thing, they waved the hands and I started to feel this and it was not good. And, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I said it wasn't going to be so, so helpful. Um, not that like anything was necessarily happening, but still, you know, my patient had the illusion that like something was happening and it wasn't a positive experience. Right. And, and they kept wanting to kind of go back to there, but it was like, you know, eventually they kind of stopped and they realized like it wasn't doing what they were hoping it was going to do. Exactly. And there's things like past life regression therapy too, where, you know, the the central tenet of that is that, you know, we have many past lives and we've been kind of reincarnated. And so uh, the past life regression therapy would be, say, treating a post-traumatic stress disorder or an anxiety disorder by regressing someone through some variant of hypnotism to go back into a past life to resolve the trauma from the life that they lived 600 years ago, say, and then yeah. kind of come back. And so there's been papers written about the, the ethics of that or, or the unethics of that and how there's even potential for implanting false memories, which that's the whole kind of uh, Pandora's box of literature. But that's also a possible thing that we can, people can be suggestible. And, you know, what does that mean for, um, for harm? Yeah. And it's, it's trouble because it's not then just the patient or the client that's going to get harmed. There's also potential for family members and everybody else to kind of get harmed by these kind of accusations potentially as well. So yes, it's trouble. It's trouble. All right. Um, and then also like uh, within the wellness industry. So there are other kind of things that are problematic, right? Chiropractics. I think we've both kind of talked about chiropractics. Um, I think it's a lot of people don't know the history or the background of where chiropractor kind of came from. Uh, do you mind sharing that or telling a little bit about that? Uh, off the top of my head, it, it was D.D. Palmer, I believe, yeah. was the, the founder. And I think there, I don't know if this is a myth or not, but they said that he um, was passed down his information from a ghost, um, yeah. something to that nature. I think I, 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 I did read those primary sources and I couldn't find that exact um, quote or kind of reference, but he was sort of a, a spiritual kind of guy. And so um, there may be merit to it. But yeah. um, u- ultimately, I think that the, the biggest problem with chiropractic is, is this idea of subl- supplications. And so that's a real thing, um, but not in, in the chiropractic form, because again, it, it all it all comes back to a form of vitalism, which is sort of this idea that it, vitalistic philosophy, where there's this there's this um, invisible human energy force that is kind of flowing through our bodies. And so any kind of spine corrections um, are thought to realign or realignments of the spine are thought to correct these energy imbalances. And then that's then um, thought to be used to, again, treat mental health disorders or any number of kind of disorders or, or health conditions. And that can be quite um, problematic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's trouble. So... <laughs> And then going with like the anti-psychiatry folks, I know these are, are, there's, there's different flavors of anti-psychiatry, correct? Um, There is like the harm community. There's the aspect of people who are just anti, truly, truly anti-psychiatry, right? They really just want to end the field and say that we're bunk and we're not doing anything, um, that we're the ones who are causing harm, like out there causing harm on purpose. Um, Mm -hmm. and the trouble that leads to what are, so I think you, you kind of referenced this a little bit before, but diving back into that a little bit, like what are some other ways that kind of shows up, um, and the potential harms that come from people campaigning against, against our field? Yeah, it's just, um, like you said, there's those different flavors. Um, you know, it started, I think it dates back to the sixties, kind of the Mm -hmm. anti-psychiatry movement. And, and then it was it was a healthy corrective. I mean, it, 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 it propelled the psychiatry to be a more scientific discipline and, and more humane. And, yeah. And it was sort of a, I think even Karl Popper was commending Thomas Saz on his book, the myth of mental illness. It kind of, and that kind of blew me away when I uh, heard Popper say that, cause he's such a uh, philosopher of science that I envied. And so it kind of blew me away, but then he was right because the, the, you know, the, the anti-psychiatry movement was kind of a helpful corrective. 
in its modern form, like you said, it's much more loose. It's not a monolith. There's, you know, there's people that identify being harmed by psychiatry. There's the Scientology movement, which is still a thing. Um, and there's there's sort of the academic branch too, which again, I, I can get in hot water for it, but uh, well, only with them. But you know, they, I think it's under the guise of critical psychiatry or critical psychology. And so these folks will kind of parrot a lot of the same anti-psychiatry tropes that we'll see, um, such as mental illness doesn't exist. Um, they'll really trivialize the nature of um, um, a lot of straw man arguments, like claiming uh, um, biological psychiatry um, is 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 the true model when that's not what psychiatry is it's a biopsychosocial model and that that's the mainstream view but that's not how they paint it yes right. you know treatment practices can be improved but that's not the way that these arguments are pitched and so again it's sort of whole scale denial of mental illness it's whole scale rejection of uh, the benefits of psychiatric treatments um, it's misinterpreting the literature saying there are no benefits of it and then and then taking it further and saying that it's actually harmful, everything from antidepressants to antipsychotics. Um, so I think that's, a, you know, that's how it shows up a lot. And, and then of course, like you said, there's kernels of truth to these things because like all areas of medicine, all areas of science, it's incomplete, right? And so we're constantly evolving, we're constantly learning. The landscape of psychopathology will change. So the DSM is, yes, it's true that it's gone through iterations. It's true that the number of disorders has uh, gone up. It's true that there are checklists, but in clinical practice, we don't just use checklists. Like assessment is much, much more involved and it takes expertise knowing that. Um, it takes expertise. I think Alan Francis, uh, who was on the, the chair of the DSM-4, yeah. I love what he said about uh, the DSM because he said that he, he equally distrusts people that worship it versus those who dismiss it entirely because it's just a rough, loose guide. It's not the quote-unquote Bible of psychiatry. And so, right. and clinical psychologists are you know evidence-based clinical psychologists use it the same way it's just it's a rough map and it's continually evolving what we see in anti-psychiatry is using that uh, creating straw man arguments to then reject um, the it, psychopathology period it's sort of the so, um, psychosocial reductionism it says brain disorders don't exist at all there's no biological component there's no heredity to psychotic disorders to bipolar disorder and so they create these straw mans and then that that creates sort of these seeds of doubt and confusion among people and that's why the antidote to that which is what i'm in part and what you're also trying to do is to, to increase mental health literacy to help people understand the nature of what we do and to be comfortable with the uncertainty and at the same time it doesn't mean we know nothing right. both truths coexist yeah unfortunately we live in this world which is very black and white yes no absolute uh where there has to be some kind of answer and that the world is not allowed to live in gray area and nuance which you know when we were fighting on twitter with people in 280 character limits that's what happens right that's what the world is you need to have snippets of information to grab attention and tiktoks again 15 seconds 30 seconds a minute whatever grab somebody's attention with a statement versus like a, a boring nuance of like sometimes this and maybe this and it depends and that's you know when people ask me stuff i'm seeing patients the number one thing i say to people is it depends <laughs> you know when i get questions from people it, it depends it depends i can't say yes i can't say no it depends will this work for me yeah maybe <laughs> right yeah. maybe it'll work depends maybe on so many so many variables yep. right so, and I think like people don't realize too, like psychiatry training and, and you can correct me, I don't know how much in psychology training as well is that like, people are like, oh, you spend five years learning about drugs. And I was like, no, <laughs> I was like, the amount of time that we spend learning like the psychopharmacology is like less than a year. I mean, it's, it does not take, you know, we have a very small arsenal of medications per se. We spent four years, five years, working on psychotherapy and looking at our patients and looking at the social interventions, the psychological interventions, learning all the psycholytic stuff. I was like, the drugs is easy. That's the easy part. That's whatever. That's nothing. You can spend an afternoon and you can learn all this stuff in, in honesty, right? It's everything else that's where the training is. And people just don't see that or don't realize that. 
Yeah, it, exactly. And to be fair, and how how could many people, right? Because they're not they don't have that expertise, and that's sort of a you know the quote unquote death of expertise, which Tom Nichols kind of um, hmm. he wrote a book on that. But that's you know that's that sort of characteristic or emblematic of our current post truth social media world, right? So those two hundred and eighty characters, it's hard to convey any of that information in a way that's that is nuanced and that is gray, um, and that you, and you're right in the sense that social media is sort of the algorithms are built or they're they're conducive to misinformation right so highly charged emotional tweets get more reach um there is actually an empirical study that um false mis- f- misinformation gets more reach it gets amplified so we know this kind of stuff the algorithms um are are built that way and so that's one way that social media kind of plays into the spread of misinformation so we are kind of working against a lot of noise and a lot of um current but it doesn't mean that it's um a lost cause either because i yeah. again i mentioned timothy caulfield who's been researching this stuff for decades and um we do know that debunking works and it works in a variety of formats so we just have to kind of keep at it but we're we're in uh we're not in our home <laughs> stadium so to speak like it's we're, it's working against us yeah it's 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 really hard because like uh, you know i've been using chat gpt a fair amount of times right to kind of like really research stuff and not just like research like learning stuff but like working with social media and other things like that and seeing like what do i have to type or write out to get traction right and it's it's saying things like zoloff makes me never have sex again for example right that gets attention versus like in a small amount of people it's very rare that sometimes people will have an effect that zoloff will cause sexual dysfunction right again what is the quote unquote you know not no pun intended but this the sexier a, a thing that's going to get people to latch onto it and, and provoke an emotion right mm-hmm. that, that first one which is again draws draws the eyes and the attention to it so it's a world right <laughs> It's tough. And, and, you know, for science communicators, it's sort of, it's relatively uncharted territory. There's no, there's no map and how to do it effectively. I mean, there's, but we're, you know, we're doing our best. And and I think a, a variety of different formats also helps. So there's the Twitter and then you're, you know, you're using your TikTok, which is, you've done amazing work there. Um, I, I'm trying to write a book, which is another kind yeah. of way of disseminating this stuff. There's talks that people do. So I don't think we need to be limited by one kind of format either. So talk about your book. So tell me about your book that's coming up and then the inspiration behind it. I think we've talked about the inspiration, but in, uh, what are like some of the take-home messages per se from there? Yeah, thank you. It's um, So I have, I have two. So one is sort of the um, a more academic book. It's a co-edited book uh, with... Dr. Stephen Hupp, who's a psychologist uh, and professor, and he's been um, he's co-edited uh, edited quite a few uh, pseudoscience books. So he asked me to come on board investigating clinical psychology specifically. So it's a really cool book that will be released in October. Um, yeah. It's more geared for like um, like an undergraduate kind of level. Uh, first year kind of psychology student, but the general public would enjoy it as well. We have a really cool um, all-star lineup of authors that contribute various chapters. So I mentioned we have a chapter on harmful psychological therapies. We have a chapter on what we've called purple hat therapies, which is, um, maybe I won't get into that now, but talking about things like EMDR, um, which is like um, the joke is that, it's, it's a joke, but there's some truth to it, is that EMDR is exposure with a purple hat, sort of an illusion. Mm-hmm. Um, so it basically saying EMDR works via exposure rather than the eye, yeah. mo- eye movement. Yeah. Um, so we have a chapter on that. We have an alternative medicine chapter, energy medicine, uh, animal assisted therapies. We have special topics in forensics and neuropsychology. So it's a really cool, um, book with a lot of, uh, experts behind it that have wrote various chapters. So I'm excited about that. My other book, uh, that is forthcoming is I'm I'm super excited about it. It's a first time uh, author. I'm I'm. It'll be published by Pub- Penguin Random House Canada, Oxford University Press, and Audible. It has a tentative release date for January 2025, which is still quite oh, a way. Wow. Um, but we've we sort of lined it up. And in that book, I'm really looking to take what I've done on Twitter 
and put it in a book essentially which i've i've been really trying to call out and so number one promote evidence-based patient care and what that involves is also calling out and debunking misinformation and pseudoscience so what i want readers to take away is to know what pseudoscience is what it looks like what are its harms how to avoid it and how to identify it how to avoid it um, situating that in the context of the wellness industry so i want to pull the curtain back on the on the wellness industry and the, the alternative medicine industry um, and then tr really trying to empower people with science literacy skills and mental health literacy skills so that they can feel empowered and emboldened to kind of take their mental health into their own hands because it really is that buyer beware approach out there with 600 more than 600 psychotherapy brands out there and with an entire uh, 4.5 trillion dollar wellness industry where um, it's just literally everywhere in pop culture uh, social media healthcare systems so that's my yeah. goal yeah you can't go anywhere without coming across now like was it apple just had their announcement yesterday your apple watch is going to be monitoring your mental health right and doing the check-ins so well that's that's yes. exciting you got your i mean you got a couple books in the pipeline so that's going to be super super cool right yes thank you yeah yes. i'm uh, super excited about it i think i got i got the pre-order in on the first one so when the second one comes out we'll we'll get that one going so i appreciate that yeah what are some, so you talked about evidence-based approaches. What are some of them and how can we, again, aside from like just the books and everything that we're doing, but like how can we make sure that we're like disseminating those as like this is the way that things should be done? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, we talk about so many different pseudoscientific treatments. We have a, we have a huge arsenal of evidence-based treatments, both psychotherapy and pharmacological treatments. And it, mm -hmm. like you said, it really depends. It depends on the nature of uh, patient presentation or what someone's sort of struggling with. Um, classic ones that people have heard of is cognitive behavioral therapy. Psychodynamic therapy is evidence-based. We have dialectical behavior therapy. Um, there's a whole arsenal of medications. Uh, there's different kinds of group therapy. In the addiction world, there's relapse prevention. Um, one thing in in the book that i talk about and that's a reality is that you know it's easy to identify the uh say the extremes of unequivocal pseudoscientific treatment so we know that energy yeah. healing is just pure pseudoscience for my, <laughs> I'll, I'll put it mild um but there's a whole lot of gray right and so yeah. um there's things like psychedelics there's things like cannabis there's things like mindfulness based therapy and um a lot of these things can work and a lot of them are also super hyped and it's really hard to navigate that world and so um and i and i empathize with you know a, a reader or just a general uh, person in the public trying to navigate that stuff because researchers are trying to navigate that stuff and it's an ongoing area so yeah. patients will ask can I microdose MDMA or uh, psilocybin to treat my depression or can I use ketamine and that's an active area of research and so what we want to be wary of is the wellness grifters who are blowing it up and saying that it's a treatment it's a cure-all for everything versus can we use this for say um, it's not the best term but treatment resistant depression which does yeah. have some evidence yeah I, you know, I became a believer in with the ketamine, just doing this bravado, the, the nasal spray with it and just being like, this works uh, for a majority of people, right? Again, not everybody mm -hmm. who have come through the, who's come through the clinic and done it. It's like, but a fair amount of people have had really, really positive responses to it. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. And there's a time and a place and, and we want to get it right. And we want to get the science right uh, yeah. versus having, again, an unregulated wellness practitioner selling mushrooms and saying that it's going to don't go to your psychiatrist, don't go to your psychologist, take these mushrooms and basically self-medicate and, and yeah. avoid evidence-based treatments. Um, and they've never had treatment before. So like that kind of stuff is dangerous versus having it monitored properly in the context of a uh, of a legitimate treatment plan with legitimate health professionals. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, uh, one of my, my number one comments on all my videos is like, this is the guy to go to, to buy shrooms online. Right. So <laughs> see, go check out yeah. this guy on Instagram to buy your shrooms online. And it's just kind of like, Oh my goodness. The bots, the bots every, every time you, yeah. Every time you mention the word mushrooms, I get like five of those bots. 
Yeah, they all come there and say yeah. bye from the sky. It's, <laughs> and it's, and it's. I think also like I thought people like again get that that small snippet of what it's supposed to be. Like, oh, I'll just take some shrooms and I'll be my depression will be gone. And again, like, or I'll just take some MDMA and my PTSD would be gone. It's like, well, actually, when you really look at what the protocol is, right, it's very complex. It's a very rigorous, structured protocol. And people were like, you know, I get asked all the time at my clinic, are you going to start offering MDMA therapy when it becomes legal? Because that's what's going to happen. I was like, I just don't think it's going to be feasible because for a course of MDMA, like, again, the logistics of it is, you need a male therapist who's been trained, a female therapist who has been trained in it. You need both of them there, I think, for the eight hours of the administration time. You need a bed. Uh, you need to have the person in the room. You need to have both, all three people in the room at the same time uh, for that yes. entire day. And I was like, what do you think that's going to cost somebody? You think that's going to be like $150? No, I think it's going to cost like five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for that day of the full eight hours. Totally, and then then the other the parallel problem to that is that the the science isn't great either because um, it was so it was promising. It started you know in the seventies and then it got yeah. shut down because yeah. no one could research this stuff. So now we've seen a resurgence of it. But then even the literature itself is murky because it's not just a dose of MDMA. We see a lot of the studies that are psychedelic assisted therapy. So it's yeah. say three sessions of MDMA in the context of fifteen sessions that also involve psychotherapy. So how do you tease those effects apart that's where we need good science that we don't necessarily have just yet yeah so it's it's, it's a little different from just buying something off an instagram ad right <laughs> and just yeah well take it and, and patients tell me and people ask all the time too like can i just take mushrooms but you know i work we work in a um again a tertiary care clinic so i, I yeah. see people with severe addiction every single day and and they have PTSD and they have depression and anxiety and they've done a lot of shrooms or hallucinogens like some of them have right and so yeah. it didn't it, it did nothing to kind of help and so again that's also a reality is sort of be wary of these breakthroughs and miracle cures so yes they can work but the way that they're touted is sort of the pseudoscientific uh, warning sign that you know we, we just need to proceed with caution and do it properly yeah and make sure that they're the right people are getting the right treatments all end of the day Exactly. With the other kind of like topic that comes up with this is like these things that we say are pseudoscience and etc. Like some of them, there are some elements of truth in them, correct? Like what are some ones that may be alternative non-Western treatments that are that you've seen that may have been helpful or actually have some legit purposes to them? Yeah. I, I, the way I'd like to answer that, because I see this a lot, sort of <laughs> yeah. um, it, in the in alternative medicine in general. So you go into a website, like if you if you search like alternative medicine and treatment of depression, you'll find a local clinic. It'll take you to a website, and again, it'll go back to these tropes. So we can address the root cause. Um, alter, um, evidence or modern medicine doesn't address these things, and what you'll notice, I think, what they get right is that there's a lot of mixing of lifestyle what they've branded lifestyle changes um so focusing on nutrition focusing on exercise focusing on stress management uh, the problem is that they pitch that as if they've co-opted it as if that's alternative medicine and as you were saying earlier that's what we do in evidence-based patient care i talk about self-care exercise nutrition every day with patients that's literally what we do and so in that sense alternative medicine gets it right because the tactic is a bait and switch they'll kind of bait people in with kind of um you know that exercise and nutrition pay attention to your diet and then they'll switch to these unequivocal treatments like homeopathy and energy healing so i think that's a really uh insidious tactic that they use and we kind of see it everywhere um again if if we want to I like to use the word steel man because we talked about straw man arguments, which is portraying something in its weakest form. Yeah. If we want a steel man alternative medicine, which is presented in its best form, I think what people, a common critique that we hear is that people turn to alternative medicine because the modern medicine healthcare system is failing them. And fair enough, right? Well, there's a lot of gaps, and I get yeah. that. Um, the 15 minute family physician 
appointments don't cut it. The yeah. long wait lists don't cut it. Seeing a specialist for 10 minutes doesn't cut it. You go to an alternative medicine practitioner, they'll listen to you for an hour or two. And so patients can feel heard and they can feel validated. And so, um, you know, they get that part right. And I think what they do is they, they inadvertently and dare I say kind of clumsily stumble upon the non-specific therapeutic factors that we know are helpful. So cultivating a therapeutic relationship, uh, instilling hope and motivation for change, um, teaching, encouraging new ways of thinking, encouraging new ways of behaving. These are what we call non-specific or common factors in therapy, which cut across CBT, psychodynamic therapy, and other forms of evidence-based practice. I think yeah. alternative medicine practitioners stumble upon that with no training. They may just have this sort of way of being with patients, but they're not trained to do it. And so people that are trained, like psychologists and other mental health professionals, they can do it better. And so I, I think, yes, we do have gaps in medicine, but we don't need to fill those gaps with pseudoscience and wellness grift. We need better access and more resources for evidence-based care. Yeah. Which is the tricky part, right? Because we are, I think we were clamoring for many, for decades, right? That we have a shortage of professionals that are out there that are able to provide, you know, the, the demand that's there. And then COVID, of course, exacerbated it and just really showed a spotlight on it that like there is this massive dearth. I think I think Dr. Jesse Gold had put out some art, not as an article, just shared an article that said like there was United Healthcare and like some state had like eight million visits the year before COVID, and then it doubled in the years after like you know twenty twenty or twenty twenty one. So it was like visits shot up, and we still know that that wasn't enough of what was needed right so it's just this massive just there is no supply of the of the people that's there so yeah and I, and you know i'm not a policy public health expert in that sense so i don't know how to solve that systemic structural kind of problem it's yeah. huge and so it, what i'm what i'm trying to do is at least empower the patient and empower the individual with the science literacy skills and the mental health literacy skills so that they can be aware of what to avoid at least and to what and what to look for at least from from the individual level yeah i was like i was going to ask one last kind of question on this topic was going to be that in addictions right we unfortunately with a lot of the patients they get a lot of that outside noise, right, from family members or friends saying, like, just stop it or just you don't need this or, you know, especially when I do a lot of work with, with opioids and you don't need to be taking Suboxone or buprenorphine, don't, that's just you're substituting and stuff like that. Like, how much of that do you see or, I know, again, you said you work a lot with in, in addictions, but, like, how much of that do you kind of come across and kind of telling people to shut out that outside noise that's there? Um, yeah, tons. I mean, that, that's just a huge theme that we, that we address in individual therapy. We address it in group therapy because people are able to bond and relate over, over those kinds of issues because people just don't feel uh, heard and understood about the nature of addiction and what it actually means. And so yeah. the people in their life will have all sorts of opinions about how to address it. And so I think a lot of the therapy work um, also involves just, um, we do a lot of work on just teaching communication skills too, and, and being able to uh, teach people assertive communication and how to voice their needs, voice their emotions, um, first to even identify what their needs are. So that's, a, that's where a lot of the therapy work is and, and learning how to communicate with family members uh, and friends and knowing um, how to set boundaries, like all of that stuff is um, huge themes in therapy. Yeah, I think it's it's half of the work, I feel like, is just telling people to shut the outside noise out so the people are offering their tips and tricks. Yeah, I, I think that's why in part, um, I mean, this is another sort of gray area, but the whole 12-step model, which people are very polarized on, yeah. um, which is the peer support groups like Alcoholics Anonymous uh, and, and its variants. And it can be helpful for a lot of people and it can be harmful for people, especially with respect to the opioids, because they're a very abstinence-based yeah. philosophy. But I think when it is found to be helpful, it's that element of relating and connection that people might not be getting with people that don't 
understand the nature of addiction. And so uh, we always encourage some sort of peer support, whether it's a 12-step model or there's other forms like smart recovery, which yeah. is more of a CBT-based kind of peer support. But we so yeah, it's sort of blocking out that noise, but also um, getting connection uh, in other ways. Getting getting the right connection more so than anything exactly. else. Yeah. All right. Wrapping up a bit. Um, any, uh, well, let's talk. I mean, we, we may be able to talk about it, but like, again, we'll bring the wrestling stuff back in a bit. Some of the psychology of wrestling. Um, what drew you to it in the first place? You, you know, you said you're more of an old school, old school guy, but what drew you to that? You know, that's a good question. I, I know. <laughs> I always liked as a kid. Yeah, I I, I just grew up watching. Uh, it was the golden era. It was yeah. Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, uh, Andre the Giant, uh, those guys. And then I think it it was weird because as I, I I watched that era as a child, and then as I grew into my adolescence, which as we know, when we go into adolescence, you start to get a more um, you get re- more rebellious. Uh, you get you're trying to find your identity, and coincidentally, as I was doing that, the nature of WWE was transforming into the Attitude Era. So then, that's sort of when <laughs> you know D Generation X was coming. I was in high school in these yeah, times, yeah. but you know D Generation X and Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. So it it changed from Hulk Hogan, you know, eat your vitamins, say your prayers, to um, profanities and explicit words which I won't say here but that's yeah. that's kind of what it was so it was appealing at that uh, age for me as well sort of into my uh, young youth and young adulthood um, yeah yeah I think that's it, it's funny right because we're around the same age so it's it's that aspect where like there was that shift that occurred and you know there's something that appeals because you're just like you you want to be like stone gold and throw your middle you you want to flip off your boss and tell him you want to tell everybody else to suck it right because um, that it lines up with your <laughs> kind of developmental yeah with, with kind of what we were going through and it was the dream right we have that we all have that dream of like being able to flip off our boss and telling him to you know you know drink a beer with your boss or whatever just throw a beer in them or whatever the hell it is but you know and, totally. and there's, there's that appeal that's that's kind of always always there with it so yeah and there's and also it's the other aspects of the psychology like there's always the goal pursuit like mm-hmm. you know you want to graduate from the intercontinental championship to the world heavyweight championship so you know it's like other kinds of sports like you're you're pursuing the championship you're pursuing a goal and you know that's a really important thing to do and um wrestling also had sort of the the team component and the connection so you had your factions your tag teams yeah. or whatever it is so there is there is that psychology there too which i think is appealing for people the, the, the hero's journey right you know the, the hero's journey the hero's exactly journey. So you Joseph, you want your Joseph Campbell. Yeah, you want your you want your golden boys and golden boys and gals now, especially now we're we're having more of the women out there and which is great. Um and just, you know, having them seeing them along their journey and overcoming adversity and all that stuff that goes along with it. Yes. Um and, and since we're on this topic too, maybe I won't name them. I did already, I guess on Twitter, but I, I was showing you there, there's some, <laughs> <laughs> there's some wrestlers out there that are spewing some really bad misinformation, a lot of anti-vaccine yeah. misinformation and like, what the hell? And that sort of was really disappointing. And uh, I wasn't, um, I was not hesitant to call them out. Let's just say. Yeah. No, there's definitely some people, some of the views are not always the best, right? And we've seen plenty of the people who've gotten in trouble for some of their non-mainstream kind of ideas, you could say. So, yeah. all right. On this topic, also wrapping up, like, what is your sense? You talked about self-care earlier, but what is your self-care? My self-care, I, it was funny because when I was in graduate school, it was, hell yeah. in the sense that uh and i think many graduate students can relate and people that you know go to higher education like it's just you work yourself to the bone because you're mm-hmm. trying to develop expertise in an area and it's really hard and um it's just it's pretty grueling and so i didn't have much self-care uh, in graduate school when i went to my residency which is my final year of phd for clinical psychology i made a decision to never work on an evening or a weekend again and I stuck to that for a good five years or so nice. um, where I would just enjoy time with my 
uh, spouse and you know we travel we we exercise we hang out with friends like we we have a great time together and that's one of my favorite things to do and after the five years or so then I started to um, I started to get back into science communication and advocacy because it was I, I enjoyed it and it was part of our ethical duty and I was self-motivated to do it which I think the academic culture beats out of you it's all about grant funding it's all about publish or perish and so it de-incentivizes that desire I needed five years away from that in order to find that natural uh, intrinsic motivation to do it again so uh, now I consider that actually part of my self-care like r you know writing a book is sort of consistent with my values and my goals and that is really a healthy thing for me versus in graduate school um it was less so <laughs> yeah it's it's so important right because we we face these ridiculous amounts of burnout um and so many other things so like the self-care is the most important thing end of the day so we preach it to our patients so we need to uh practice ourselves so absolutely it's it's a balance between productivity and leisure um and yeah, just sort of your general um, biological self-care, eating well, sleeping well, exercising, yeah. that kind of stuff. All right. Any parting words or how can we, how can people follow along with your journey and stuff too? Um, yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciated talking with you. Yeah. Um, best way to follow me on my journey is I'm primarily on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And I recently started a uh, mind the science newsletter on Substack. So mind the science is the tentative name for, for the book that I'm writing. Um, and so if people would like to sign up for that newsletter, um, I just provide updates on, on my progress towards that and, and various interviews that I do and, um, other sort of, uh, things I may write about kind of debunking pseudoscience and misinformation, but that's sort of the place to kind of keep updated on what I'm doing. So I appreciate anyone that's interested <laughs> in that. Yeah. We'll definitely drop yeah. all the links in there. So Dr. Say, it was a pleasure, always a pleasure catching up. So finally it was nice to like officially, officially do this. So yeah, totally. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it.